EAA's webinars are made possible through the generous support of Aircraft Spruce and Specialty, serving home builders and EAA members since 1965. Tonight's presentation is titled Operating Over Square. Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. He's an author for numerous aviation publications over many years now. Mike holds a certified flight instructor certificate. He holds an AMP mechanic certificate with inspection authorization privileges. He's the Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year uh, through the FAA in 2008 and a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much for being with us tonight and sharing this information. I'm going to turn control of the presentation over to you. Uh, good evening, uh, Tim, and good evening, everybody. I'm sort of uh, blown away by how many people are in the room. It looks like we're in the process of closing in on uh, almost 900 people in the room. This may set a record. Tim, are you seeing my screen? I got your screen. It's looking great on my uh, on my computer here, Mike. Okay, great. Um, well, we're going to be talking about uh, a little different subject today. Most of the webinars I do are are maintenance related. This is uh, this one is flying related, and I'm going to be talking about operating over square. I I learned to fly in 1965, a long time ago. Uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, I uh, learned to fly in little uh, straight-tailed, uh, no rear window Cessna 150. Um, got my private pilot's license, moved to the East Coast. And for the first several years after I got my ticket, I uh, was flying rental airplanes, uh, Cessna 172s, the Cherokee 140s, and so on. Um, all of these airplanes uh, that I trained in, uh, got my instrument rating in, um, and my initial experience in were all um, simple airplanes, fixed gear, fixed pitch prop. Um, and then in 1968, I uh, decided to buy my first airplane, and it was a Cessna 182. Um, this uh, airplane was the very first uh, complex airplane that I had flown. And so <clears throat> I uh, spent a good deal of time preparing uh, to, uh, to pick up this airplane and at the Cessna factory and fly it home to California um, by flying with a, with a CFI. And um, we, uh, uh, flew in a, a, a rented Cessna 182, and it had a bunch of new stuff that I hadn't been uh, exposed to before in my flying. Um, it had a propeller control, most notably. It had a manifold pressure gauge. It had an EGT gauge. And um, so my flight instructor uh, spent a lot of time uh, talking to me about how to use all of this stuff, how to manage the constant speed prop, how to uh, manage the power plant using manifold pressure and RPM, how to use the EGT gauge for leaning. And um, to summarize what, uh, what he taught me and what the uh, conventional wisdom at the time was, he said, we, uh, we, we must never operate these engines in an over square condition. That is, with manifold pressure above RPM over 100. So if you're at 2,400 RPM, you can't have a manifold pressure over 24 inches and so on. Um, and he was very emphatic about this. He said, you know, if you operate the engine over square, uh, you, you're going to blow the cylinders right off the engine. And in order to make sure you were never in an over square condition, there were a bunch of rules about how you made power changes. If you were reducing power, you always reduce manifold pressure with the throttle before reducing RPM with the prop control. And conversely, when you were increasing power, you always needed to increase RPM before you increase manifold pressure. That way, the, the engine would never be operating in one of these dreaded over-squirk conditions. He also 
taught me to lean with the uh, with with the EGT gauge, um, and the instructions were to uh, to to lean to peak EGT and then rich in until you were 125 degrees on the rich side of peak, which put you roughly at at best power mixture. So that's how I flew my Skylane. Um, after a while, I started getting a little bit more sophisticated, and I decided that uh, cruising around at 125 degrees rich peak wasn't uh, really necessary. So I started uh, leaning the airplane a little more aggressively. Um, we didn't operate uh, Lena Peak back in those days, and the 0470 and the Skylane probably wouldn't operate Lena Peak without getting the shakes. But um, but I did a lot of operating up around peak EGT uh, in contravention of what my CFI taught me, and uh, nothing bad happened. <laughs> um, any rate, some years later, uh, 1973 to be exact, um, I sold the Skylane and I bought my second airplane, which was a Belanca Super Viking, and I, I felt the need for speed. Um, the Viking, which is an airplane comparable to, say, a Beach Bonanza, um, it was powered by a 300 horsepower Continental IO520 engine, um, and uh, I transferred over um, most of my practices from the Skylane to, to flying the Viking. Um, and then while I owned the, uh, the Viking, I got involved in a public uh, benefit flying organization called the Flying Samaritans. Uh, the Flying Samaritans, and they still exist, um, uh, was in the business of flying medical and dental teams, uh, doctors, dentists, nurses, down to remote areas of Mexico. Um, and the Southern California chapter that I was involved in, um, we, we would diff typically fly teams down into Baja, California. And that was back before the, the, the road down through Baja was paved. And so it was very, very difficult to get to these communities. Uh, and mostly our, the missions that we flew, and I think um, I, I flew one mission about every four weeks down in Mexico, uh, were pretty much the only medical and dental care that these people that these people had, so it was a very gratifying experience. But we were flying to very remote areas where typically there were no services, um, landing on a lot of short dirt strips, sometimes landing on roads in the middle of farm fields. Um, there was one airport that we landed on that was underwater twice a day, so we had to time our arrival and departure with the tides. It was, it was pretty cool flying, actually. Um, but uh, because of that, we typically had to um, uh, carry enough fuel to get all the way down to where we were going and then all the way back, because typically at most of these places that we were flying into, there was no fuel available. And so, um, and I was carrying pretty heavy loads in the airplane because we typically filled them up full of full of medical people and medical supplies. And when we flew dentists down, we would bring down drills and all sorts of things that dentists use. So we were flying pretty heavy. Um, and so I got real interested in how I could fly this airplane um, more fuel efficiently to get as much range as possible out of the fuel loads that, that I was carrying down. And I wound up reading um, some stories uh, back from World War II about uh, Charles Lindbergh. Um, uh, Charles Lindbergh um, uh, was very involved, of course, with the, uh, uh, during World War II with, with helping uh, our, um, our military pilots uh, learn how to get the most out of their airplanes. And um, he taught bomber and fighter pilots how to achieve much greater range than they were previously getting through optimum power plant management, mostly by using over square operation um, uh, with, with high manifold pressures and low RPMs and aggressively lean mixtures, all things that the uh, I guess what passed for the pilot operating handbooks back then uh, said you weren't supposed to do. But Lindbergh uh, taught these crews 
how to use these techniques to get much better range out of the airplanes. Um, for example, the P-38, uh, P-38 Lightning, which is a big twin-engine fighter, um, was considered at that time to have a maximum operational range of 400 miles. Uh, Lindbergh ta taught the P-38 pilots through these techniques of operating over square and leaning uh, very, very aggressively to stretch the range of a P-38 to 950 miles, more than twice what uh, crews were previously able to to get out of the airplane. This obviously was an enormous tactical advantage to them. Um, he also uh, uh, taught bomber pilots uh, uh, how to use the same techniques when they were uh, ferrying uh, men and equipment uh, over the Atlantic to, uh, to, to, uh, to England during the war. Uh, at first, when, when, when Lindbergh started preaching this stuff, um, a lot of the pilots were reluctant to follow his advice because they had been taught by their instructors what I was taught by my instructor, which is if you do this, you're going to blow up the engine. But ultimately, uh, the wisdom of Lindy's guidance was uh, uh, accepted and became standard operating procedure for the air crews. At any rate, I found this very interesting, and I decided that I was going to start um, uh, looking into the possibility of using these same uh, approaches of, of uh, over square operation and lean mixtures um, in my own flying, particularly the, the, the flying down to Mexico where, where I had, uh, I, I needed the maximum uh, fuel efficiency and range I could possibly get. And so I started doing a little research to find out what Belanca or Continental had to say about operating an engine over square. Uh, Belanca was singularly unhelpful. They didn't have anything useful to say about it. The, they, they provided their standard guidance in the pilot operating handbook and uh, really wasn't, uh, weren't, weren't able to give me any more information. Um, but I did discover um, that there was a operator's manual published by Continental uh, for the IO520 engine uh, in my Viking. This was not the POH and not something that came from Belanca, but something that could be obtained from Continental Motors. And I dug through the, um, the, the operator's manual uh, for the engine and discovered a very interesting uh, chart um, about midway through the manual. Um, and, and it's this chart, and, and th this was a chart that, that plotted horsepower on the vertical axis, manifold pressure on the horizontal axis, uh, various RPMs as diagonal lines, and then drew a, a shaded envelope. Um, apparently, this looks like it was uh, created before uh, uh, computerized drawing, because it looks like it was sort of hand, hand done. Um, but but it uh, it, it uh, depicted the recommended what they call the recommended cruise region an envelope a set of manifold pressure and RPM settings um, that were uh, recommended um, for cruise operation and when I looked at it I discovered uh, something pretty interesting um, if you look at the edge of this envelope that I've shaded with a red line, um, this th that is the edge of the envelope that represents um, maximum manifold pressure and minimum RPM that Continental uh, said was acceptable for, for, for this engine. And if you take a look at it, you'll discover that the maximum uh, over square condition, if you will, was was quite significant. That Continental did not buy the, at least Continental engineers did not buy this uh, conventional teaching that we need to limit our engines to no more than square operation, if you will. And they allowed um, considerably higher manifold pressure and lower RPMs than what my flight instructor said was safe to use. Um, if, if you look at the various points uh, on this diagram, you'll see that um, um, between two and a half and four inches over square, uh, it was uh, permissible uh, by Continental Motors. 
Um, got me kind of interested about lycoming. So I, I ferreted out a similar chart for lycomings. Again, uh, this, these were charts that were published by lycoming, but not in any pilot operating handbook for any lycoming powered airplane. And they had a similar looking diagram that looked like this. Um, this one is for the uh, O360. Uh, I happen to pick this one because we we have a lot of uh, uh, we deal with a lot of RVs that are powered by O360s. And again, if you take a if I if I blow up this this area a little bit more, you'll see that Lycoming allows even greater over square operation. Uh, at that edge of the recommended envelope. Um, they, they allow operation up to five inches over square for the O360 engine. Um, so this was, uh, this was pretty interesting stuff. And I vowed that I was going to start experimenting uh, with, uh, with over square operation in, in my Balanca Viking, uh, during, particularly during these missions down in Mexico. Now, um, when I talk about this particular subject to continental owners, there's always something that comes up that I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of uh, a, uh, a detour here and, and mention just because I know the question will come up otherwise. Um, in 2009, Continental issued a service bulletin, CSB 09-11. Um, and this was a service bulletin that um, made a recommendation that Continental had never made before. Um, and it covered almost all of the big bore Continental engines, uh, 470s, 520s, 550 engines, both normally aspirated and uh, turbocharged. Um, and it basically uh, said, and, and I'll talk a little bit about where this thing came from, but, but in 2009, uh, Continental came out with a service bulletin that, that said that uh, Continental strongly recommends that engine cruise RPM settings should be no lower than 2300 RPM. Um, now, up until this time, um, uh, Almost all of our pilot operating handbooks uh, permitted RPM settings way lower than 2300. Um, in in, uh, in the Viking, it it, it allowed uh, RPMs down to I think um, 1900 or 2000 RPM. In the Cessna 310 that I fly now, which is uh, Continental powered, um, uh, it allows RPMs down at 2100. But the service bulletin from Continental is warning that they recommend not reducing RPM below 2300 RPM, which would um, make it difficult to, to use um, many of these over square power settings. Um, as it happens, I'm inti intimately familiar with the backstory uh, of where this service bulletin came from because um, uh, it, it, it came from um, uh, some incidents involving a Part 121 air carrier up in the uh, Boston area called Cape Air. Cape Air at that time operated the world's largest fleet of Cessna 402C aircraft um, that were powered by turbocharged Continental 520 engines, TSIO 520 engines. And um, they wound up having a couple of engine failures on these airplanes that turned out to be um, caused by the crankshaft counterweights um, uh, basically coming loose from the crankshaft due to uh, accelerated wear of the pins and bushings that hold those counterweights in place. Um, and uh, as a result, after the second engine failure, they grounded their entire fleet. Continental came up to, to the Boston area and, and they started looking at a bunch of their engines and discovered that they were having accelerated counterweight um, pin and bushing wear and other engines. And as a result of that, um, Continental issued this very sweeping service bulletin 
uh, almost all of their big bore engines saying don't don't run these engines below 2300 rpm it's a it's a service bullet and it's not an ad it, it it's 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 not an, an operating limitation it's just a recommendation by continental um however it turns out you know i i was good friends with the director of maintenance the vice president of maintenance at cape air and we talked about this at some length back in 2009 when it occurred and it turned out that the Cape Air airplanes were operated in a pretty unusual way. Uh, first of all, I flew a lot. Each of those airplanes was flying uh, around 500 hours a year. Um, these were very high cycle ops, by which I mean uh, lots and lots of takeoffs and landings, very short uh, cruise phases. Um, these airplanes, uh, um, Mostly we're flying uh, routes between um, Boston, Martha's Vineyard, uh, Nantucket, and Hyannis, Massachusetts. Very, very short legs of, of you know, 15 minutes or less. Hardly enough to, to justify retracting the gear. <laughs> um, and furthermore, besides being very high cycle operations, uh, the pilots were operating these engines um, in Richard Peak Cruise in an area that we now know is very abusive to the engine. Um, if you've listened to any of my leaning webinars, they were operating these airplanes, what we refer to as inside the red box, uh, putting very high internal cylinder pressure, generating high in cylinder, uh, internal cylinder pressures and very high torsional stresses on the crankshaft and the torsional stresses on the crankshaft were being absorbed by these counterweights that ultimately failed. Um, in, in contrast to the way Cape Air operates, I, I happen to fly an airplane these days that, that also uses a TSI 0520 engine. It's a pretty similar engine to the one in the Cape Air airplanes, but my operations are drastically different than the way Cape Air was flying your airplane. Uh, mine are low cycle ops. I, I take long trips, um, typically fly for hours at a time between landing takeoffs and landings. I always operate at Lena P cruise, which re drastically operating dr Lena P drastically reduces the, the internal cylinder pressures and the torsional stresses on the crankshaft. And, uh, I operated at very low RPMs in, in my airplane, uh, for thousands of hours. And after, uh, more than 3,000 hours, 220% of TBO. Um, uh, my, my right engine was torn down, and uh, there was absolutely no sign of abnormal wear of the counterweight pins or bushings, um, even, because, even though I was operating at very low RPMs and very far over square. So um, my, my personal feeling about the Continental Service Bulletin is that if you operate your engine the way Cape Air operates it, th it's prob there's probably some good reason not to run low RPMs. If you operate your engine the way I do, in particular, if you're operating Lena Peak and Cruise, which is much, much gentler on the equipment than Richard Peak, and particularly the, the, the inside the red box kind of Richard Peak that Cape Air was using, uh, I, I don't think the 2300 RPM limitation is uh, is necessary, and and so I, I choose not to not to observe it. Um, and people have been flying these engines for decades before the service bulletin came out um, w without any problems until the Cape Air incident. So I, I think it was sort of anomalous. But at any rate, um, I bought my third airplane, uh, my, my the Cessna 310 that I still own and fly uh, in 1987. Um, the pilot operating handbook recommended that crews be at Richard Peak at uh, 29 inches of manifold pressure and 2100 RPM, which is eight inches over square. I, I flew it that way for a few years until I smartened up a little bit. And starting about 1990, um, I, I started operating the engines Lena Peak and operating them uh, at 32 inches of manifold pressure instead of 29 inches and 2100 RPM, which is like 11 inches over square. And as I said, um, after uh, 
2009 when Continental came out with the service bulletin, um, CSBO 911, um, I researched it and made a conscious decision that I was not going to follow that recommendation. I'm not saying that, that you ought to do the same thing I uh, am doing. It's, it's, uh, it's up, to, up to everybody. But if you're flying a Continental um, engine, at least you should kind of understand the, the backstory of this thing. So uh, with that, let me tell you a little bit about the benefits of operating over square and why I think operating it high manifold pressure and low RPM, the thing that my old flight instructor told me would always blow up, would blow up the engine, why it's really a good thing. And there are a lot of reasons. Some of them are pretty obvious. Some of them are pretty subtle. Um, but let me kind of run through um, some of the benefits of, of operating engines over square. Um, first of all, one of the most obvious things when, when you operate engines this way is it's a lot quieter. Lots quieter outside the airplane, a lot quieter inside the airplane. Um, when we run the uh, propeller at lower RPM, there are, is uh, the, the prop tip speeds are lower, they generate less shock waves, we get less noise. And the noise that we get is at a lower frequency, which is less annoying. And if you wear an, uh, an active noise reduction headset, which I think most of us nowadays do, um, the, the lower frequency is, is much easier for the ANR headset to suppress. So it's quieter. Um, second reason, which is maybe a, a little less obvious, is that when we operate engines at low RPM, we have less frictional losses in the engine. Um, the, the frictional losses inside the engine and the primary frictional losses are, are actually uh, the, the friction involved of, of the cylinders uh, and rings reciprocating inside the, I mean, the, the pistons and rings reciprocating inside the cylinders. There are some small frictional losses involving rotating stuff, but the primary losses ha have to do with the uh, pushing the, uh, the, the pistons and their compression rings up and down inside the cylinder. And those frictional losses um, increase with increasing RPM and they increase more than linearly. Um, so as RPM increases, uh, friction increases even faster. Um, and if we can operate the engine at low RPM, we lose a lot less power to frictional losses and more of the power that the engine is generating actually makes it to the propeller uh, which is really where we're trying to get it. Um, and, and once it gets to the propeller, um, operating the props at lower RPM provide better propeller efficiency. Um, props like to turn slower. Again, the part of the problem is that a fast turning prop um, spends a lot of its energy generating um, acoustic shock waves because the tip speeds are rapid um, and that that energy is uh, essentially makes noise rather than thrust. Uh, the slower we can turn the prop, the more efficient it's going to be. That's why on geared engines and on turboprops, which are all geared, uh, where they can basically turn the props any speed they want to just by adjusting the gear ratio, um, those airplanes always turn their propellers much more slowly than our direct drive engines do typically something less than 2000 RPM. Um, when, when we operate direct drive engines, which most of us do, um, unless you're flying a Rotax or a Cessna 421 with a Gitzo engine, um, but if you have a direct drive engine, the RPM that we cruise at is a compromise between getting um, maximum power out of the engine, which requires high RPM, and getting maximum performance out of the propeller, which requires low RPM. So mostly if you have a direct drive engine, we're, we're, we're turning the props, um, you know, most people cruise it at, you know, 24, 2500 RPM. Um, and that's, uh, that's not the optimum speed uh, for propeller, propeller efficiency. And it also um, isn't as optimal in terms of, uh, of frictional losses in the engine. Um, another reason 
the engine breathes better at low RPM. Um, the, 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 we call it, engineers call this volumetric efficiency, and it basically has to do with the fact that when an engine runs, we have to stuff air into the cylinders through a, an intake valve. Um, and uh, there are some losses involved in, 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 getting, in, in getting that air into the cylinder. Um, the faster the engine turns and the more frequently we have to stuff that carriage of air into the cylinders, the more losses that there are um, in, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, these pumping losses. So lower RPM provides better volumetric efficiency uh, than high RPM. Um, if you want to really turn an engine fast, like we typically do in automotive engines, they'll do things like like putting, you know, two intake valves per cylinder and so on in there to to improve the volumetric efficiencies at, at high RPMs. We don't have anything like that in our aircraft engines. They're pretty primitive. Um, so uh, we get some some efficiency benefits by, by turning the engine slowly. Also, um, th the further we can open the throttle, the, the less loss the engine has trying to suck air through a partially closed throttle plate. Again, closing the throttle for, to something less than wide open throttle um, uh, increases these pumping losses. So, from a pure volumetric efficiency standard, uh, the, the best bet is, is to operate an engine at wide open throttle and low RPM, which is exactly the way I operate my aircraft. Um, then we get into something even, even more subtle, um, and that is that if we turn the engine at low RPM, um, it increases the amount of time between the time that the spark plug fires and the combustion event starts to develop and the time that the exhaust valve opens and we dump whatever is left of the combustion event out the back door. Um, this is particularly important when we're operating Lena Peak because uh, the leaner the mixture, the, the slower the combustion event takes place. That's why it's gentler on the engine. That's why it's general or gentler on the crankshaft and those counterweights we were talking about. But it takes longer. And in order to give the, uh, the slower combustion event that we have when we're operating lean enough time to play out before we throw up our hands, open the exhaust valve, and throw the rest of it out the back door, we need to increase the time between the, the, when the spark plug fires and when the exhaust valve opens. Now, um, if we had a nice fancy um, FADEC engine, we could do that by advancing the, the spark plug timing and, or the, the ignition timing and having the spark plug fire earlier. But most of us don't have that. Most of us, uh, including me, are flying engines with, with fixed timed magnetos, what I call tractor mags. And the only way we have to provide uh, more time between the time the, the spark plug fires and the time the exhaust valve opens is by slowing down the RPM with the propeller control. Um, so um, this next slide attempts to kind of show what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a, a set of three curves uh, of the instantaneous um, pressure inside the the, the uh, cylinder's combustion chamber, um, starting from the point of ignition, um, rising to a peak, and gradually falling, and then eventually being dumped out the exhaust valve when it opens. And you'll see the there's three different curves there: one for 75 degrees richer peak, which is the the, the highest peak one for 50 degrees lean a peak and one for 100 degrees lean a peak, very, very, very aggressively lean mixture. And you can see that um, um, 
actually it looks to me like those labels between the 50 and the 100 are, are inverted. I, I, I think there's a mistake on that slide. But the point being that the leaner the mixture, the lower the peak pressure, and the longer the combustion event takes to play out. Um, because the, com the, the the flame front simply um, uh, propagates more slowly with a lean mixture than it does with a rich mixture. So in order not to dump an excessive amount of 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 uh, of the, the this hard earned uh, combustion pressure that we've spent so much money in avgas to generate uh, to not dump excessive amounts of it out the exhaust valve and give the engine time to extract as much of it as possible um, before the exhaust valve opens, we need to provide adequate time between the ignition point and the exhaust valve open point. And we do that by, by lowering, um, lowering RPM. So the leaner you run, the more important it is to operate it at slow RPM. Um, by the way, the, the, uh, here's, a, here's a diagram that, that shows um, how the, uh, the the efficiency problems we have with our spark ignition engines um, of of the energy that is latent in the avgas that we burn only about a third of it winds up uh, getting to the propeller where it can propel us through the air uh, the rest of it is wasted in various ways and the biggest um, the the biggest share of the energy that's wasted. The, the thing that's marked auto cycle losses uh, is, is the stuff that we wind up dumping out the exhaust valve because the engine isn't capable of extracting uh, all the energy out of the fuel. If, if, if the engine could extract all the energy out of the fuel, uh, the exhaust would, would, would be at, at ambient room temperature. Uh, the cylinder heads would operate at ambient room temperature because 100% of the fuel energy would be converted into work and none of it would be converted into heating stuff up. But of course, that's not, that's not the case. And, and we actually waste about two thirds of the energy in our fuel um, uh, to these various kinds of losses. And we only manage to extract about one third of the energy um, uh, for, for doing useful work of propelling us through the air. Um, we do better than this on diesel engines. Uh, they're more efficient. Um, the, the, the losses are similar, but, but they're less and, and we get uh, a greater percentage of the energy in the fuel is actually converted into work with diesels. But this diagram is for, for a spark ignition engine like most of what we fly. Um, <clears throat> here's an interesting um, uh, chart that that was um, a taken from a test flight that we flew uh, in a um, uh, an F-33A Bonanza actually um, where we operated the engine um, in two different configurations uh, for uh, four or five minutes each. Um, the first uh, Part of it, of it the, the part that's marked over square, we operated this engine, uh, and this was a, an IO520 a Continental engine, at 27 inches of manifold pressure and 2100 RPM. So it was six inches um, over square um, and, and operated Lena Peak. Uh, the second uh, area was also operated Lena Peak, but in an undersquare condition where manifold pressure was 21 inches and RPM was 2,500 RPM. Um, now, if you look at the red line down near the bottom of the graph, that's fuel flow. And since we know that when we're operating Lena Peak, horsepower is uh, directly proportional to fuel flow, um, we know that we were up, we were putting out uh, almost exactly the same amount of horsepower in both of these uh, runs, both the over square run and the under square run. But if you look up higher on the chart, uh, you'll see a, a bunch of lines marked CHTs, and you'll notice that the CHTs in the under square run were noticeably higher uh, 
than they were in the over square run. Again, exactly the same power output. Why was were the CHT higher? Primarily because of increased frictional losses, turning the engine at 2,500 RPM as opposed to 2,100 RPM. Um, and those frictional losses, which are reflected in higher CHTs, uh, represents energy that didn't go out to the propeller because it was it was um, expended heating up the cylinder more. Um, and then if you look at the top group of lines, those are EGTs, you'll notice a dramatic difference um, between the EGTs during the, in the oversquare operation and the EGTs in the undersquare operation. The EGTs in the oversquare operation were much, much cooler. Why were they cooler? Because we turned the engine slower, so there was more time for the engine to extract power from the fuel-air mixture before the exhaust valve opened. And EGT represents the temperature of what was sent out the exhaust valve after the exhaust valve opened. So um, it, it's clear that we extracted more power uh, and, and threw less away um, in, in the oversquare operation and the undersquare uh, operation. And you can see that see that from the uh, from the difference in EGTs. So, any rate, this I just put this up to kind of demonstrate um, what what I've been saying about the various advantages involved in operating over square. Let me end by telling you a quick story. Um, uh, I uh, this is a story uh, that happened several years ago um, and involved the uh, a new owner of a brand new uh, Cirrus SR22. He bought this uh, SR22. Um, he studied everything he could about it. He started flying the airplane and he noticed that he was starting to, he was periodically um, getting uh, engine stumbles and what sounded like backfires uh, while he was cruising the airplane. Um, he was operating the airplane uh, Lena Peak uh, as his uh, Sarah certified instructor had taught him to do. And these engine stumbles and um, backfires were, were were quite disturbing and a little bit frightening. And this is a brand new airplane. So he took it into the shop and reported the problem. And because the airplane was under warranty, the, the shop called Continental and said, we're having this problem with this brand new airplane, with this brand new Continental Platinum IO550 uh, and engine. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's backfiring and stumbling in, in cruise. So Continental did what it normally does when somebody calls in with a warranty claim. It sent the shop apart. It sent the shop a new fuel pump. And the shop replaced the fuel pump and readjusted the fuel system and gave the owner back the airplane. And he went flying in the airplane and there was no change. He was still um, having the same problems with backfires and engine stumbling. And so he brought the airplane back to the shop and said that that didn't fix anything. So the shop called Continental. Continental sent them a new fuel control unit. So they dutifully installed the new fuel control unit and played, returned the airplane to the owner and the owner went flying and exactly the same thing happened. He was still getting the backfires and the stumbling. And by this time, his wife wouldn't fly with him anymore because this was just, just too upsetting. He brought the airplane back uh, to the shop a third time uh, they had already replaced the fuel pump and the fuel control unit. So pretty much the only thing left in the fuel system was the manifold valve that replaced the manifold valve. And of course that didn't cure the problem. Finally, in desperation, he gave me a phone call and I asked him, he, uh, this airplane had a, had, had an Av Avidine MFD installed. And I asked him if he would dump his engine monitor data so I could take a look at it. Uh, he sent me the engine monitor data. I took a look at the data and discovered that he was running the engine Lena Peak at 2700 RPM. So I got back to him and I said, you know, these engines don't right, like to run Lena Peak at 2700 RPM. Uh, 
at 2,700 RPM, the, the exhaust valve is opening while, while the, the, the mixture is still burning and it's going out into the exhaust and finishing its combustion out there. And that's what you're hearing when you're hearing the backfires. And I recommend that you um, reduce to something uh, to 2,500 RPM or lower when you're cruising the airplane lean a peak. So he did that. And of course, the problems went away. Um, the, 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 the shop Continental never, it never occurred to them to go take a look to see how he was actually operating the engine. They all assumed that it was a hardware problem, but it wasn't, it was a software problem. <laughs> so, um, and, and now I think you, you understand why it was happening to him and, um, why it's important to, uh, consider at least the possibility of operating at low RPM. So, Tim, that's all I have as far as prepared material, but I would be happy to, uh, to, to entertain some Q&A. Okay, Mike, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, let's start with Joe's question uh, first. Oh. What is your process to get to lean of peak? Is it reduce manifold pressure first or RPM? Uh, well, it's neither. Um, the The procedure to to transition from richer peak to lena peak is um and and actually i cover this pretty pretty thoroughly in a couple of uh, a couple of leaning uh, webinars that that are in the ea uh, webinar archive um but it's simply uh what we uh, maneuver we call a big mixture pull where you essentially grab the red red knob and pull it briskly um from a, a richer peak mixture to a lena peak mixture uh, you do it briskly because we don't want to spend any more time than we absolutely have to between the 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 rich mixture and the lean mixture because all the stuff in between is is um, is harmful to the engine it's the inside the red box stuff that we're trying to avoid it's you know precisely why the cape air engines <laughs> had the problems that they had um, and so we we, uh, we we lean rapidly, uh, going from richer peak to leaner peak in order to avoid spending more than a couple of seconds in the intermediate area between um, richer peak and leaner peak. Um, but that's all that's involved. If you ever went flying with me in my airplane, uh, you you would just be amazed at how infrequently I touch the power controls. I mean, for example, I go to full throttle in my airplane uh, at the beginning of the takeoff roll, and I never touch the throttle again until it's time to land. Um, I, I climb, cruise, and descend at 32 inches of manifold pressure, never touch anything. You might as well tie wrap the throttle all the way open for the, the way I fly my airplane. And if I could figure out a way to land at full throttle, I'd do that, but I haven't figured that out yet. So I have to pull the throttle back when it comes time to land, but I don't touch it before that. Um, uh, on takeoff, I will, after takeoff, after climbing out of say a thousand feet, I'll normally reduce RPM. Um, and uh, I'll reduce it once uh, for cruise climb. I'll reduce it a second time when I level off in cruise and then I'll never touch the RPM again until, uh, I, actually never, until the engine is shut down and, and the airplane's in the chocks. And the mixture control, um, in my airplane, because it's turbocharged, all my takeoffs are made at full rich. Uh, my climbs are at full rich. And when I get to cruise, I do this big, big mixture pull and pull the mixture back sharply to a lean at peak setting and leave it there uh, right up until it's time to shut the engine down at the other end of the flight. Uh, the fact that it's turbocharged airplane simplifies my, uh, my leaning. Um, uh, I don't have to lean in the climb and I don't have to rich in the descent because the engine, a turbocharged engine thinks it's at sea level all the time, regardless of what altitude you're actually at. In a normally aspirated engine, if I fly bananas or something like that, I do um, have to lean uh, progressively as I climb and rich in progressively as I descend. Um, that's not something I have to do uh, in my in a turbocharged airplane, as I said, because the engine doesn't know that it's climbing or descending. It always thinks it's at sea level. 
Mona's wondering, can one safely operate a carbureted engine like a Lycoming 0540 Lena Peak, or is Lena Peak operation only acceptable for IO fuel injected engines? Uh, you can operate any engine Lena Peak uh, as long as the engine will run smoothly Lena Peak. Uh, most Lycoming engines have pretty good, uh, I mean, uh, let me back up. Most carbureted Lycoming engines have pretty good mixture distribution um, uh, and and can operate Lena Peak. They can't operate as profoundly Lena Peak as an injected engine with, with a position two nozzles, um, but they can op typically operate mildly Lena Peak and, and that's a good place to operate them. Um, there are some carbureted engines, uh, and the worst offender that I know of is the is the 0470 in, in my beloved Skylane um, that have miserable mis mixture distribution, and it's very, very hard to operate them lean a peak without the engine getting rough. Um, I, I, I can operate an 0470 a little bit lean a peak by using a bunch of tricks, but um, it, it's tough because that engine has poor mixture distribution the, because of the design, the asymmetrical design of the induction system. The rear cylinders always run lean and the front cylinders always run rich and it's really hard to run an engine lean a peak when the cylinders are not all running at the same mixture. But the Lycomings tend to have a, a pretty symmetrical induction system um, and the, the carbureted Lycomings and so they tend to do a pretty good job of operating at least mildly lean a peak um, and, uh, and, and we often operate them that way. Paul is wondering, is there any way to capture these gains with a fixed pitch prop? Well, uh, you know, of course you don't, you don't have the over square stuff you, with a fixed pitch prop. You obviously can operate a fixed pitch prop airplane Lena Peak, but you really can't uh, um, do over square stuff. Uh, you, the relationship between uh, manifold pressure, which you don't have an instrument, but it's basically throttle position, um, and uh, RPM is not something that that you really have control over. It it just is kind of the nature of the beast. So um, you can't do nearly as much with with a fixed pitch prop airplane in 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 this regard. And of course, all of the the the, the military aircraft that Lindy was dealing with back during. Uh, World War II uh, all had uh, had control had uh, constant speed propeller, so that was why he was able to uh, to teach the flight crews to to do all of this stuff. Hmm. Jerry's wondering uh, with uh, turbocharged engines. I agree, the horsepower is the same running over square versus under square. How about normally aspirated? It seems to me reducing the RPM from twenty five to twenty four hundred or even less horsepower reduces. Well, again, it, it, just if think about the the F thirty three A test run that we did. Um, we, we maintained constant power by um, reducing RPM and increasing manifold pressure. Now, um, we that test run was done at a relatively low altitude where there was plenty of manifold pressure available. And I agree with you that if you uh, have a normally aspirated airplane and you climb it up to a, a higher altitude. Um, Mother Nature takes away <laughs> your manifold pressure, so you 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 get progressively more and more limited at higher altitudes as to as to um, uh, how much manifold pressure you have. But for example, with the O320, um, the, the, you, you remember one of those one of those uh, authorized uh, uh, power settings was was 1900 RPM and um, and 23 inches. And you can get 23 inches up, you know, relatively high. Um, uh, but uh, but but sure, the the the, the, oppor the opportunity to run over square is less in, in a normally aspirated engine, and it becomes less and less and less as you get up to higher altitudes, where the manifold pressure available goes away. Joseph is wondering, is there a minimum RPM for cruise and is there a maximum difference between manifold pressure and RPM? Well, again, that's, those were the charts that I was showing you and it's different for every engine. And, and I recommend that uh, 
anybody who wants to start exploring this stuff should should go get a copy of the engine operator's manual from from uh, for their particular engine from Lycoming or Continental. Go find the graph uh, that that I illustrated for your particular engine and see what the limits that uh, that the manufacturer um, um, uh, provides as far as how far lean to peak your uh, excuse me how far uh, over square uh, you're allowed to go. It's it's different for every engine. I just illustrated, uh, you know, two engines on my slides: it's a, a, a Continental I0520 and a, and a and a Lycoming 0360. Um, but there, these manuals are available for uh, for pretty much all the engines, and uh, you, you can find a graph like, you know, similar to the graph that I showed you on the on these slides uh, for your particular engine. David is wondering, he says, I've been told when rich of peak, fuel goes out the exhaust, cooling the exhaust valve. When cruising lean of peak, you lose this cooling. This can lead to premature exhaust valve problems or failures. What's your thoughts on this? Well, um, my thoughts on it is it, that, that it's, that it's a, a, a considerable misunderstanding of what's going on. Um, the, the, it is true that 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 you can uh, cool the gas temperatures by throwing excess fuel on it. You can also cool, cure. Uh, you can also cool uh, the, the the gas temperature by by uh, uh, reducing fuel. And the point in in the middle where temperature is hottest is is called peak EGT, and temperatures go down um, both going lean of peak EGT and going rich of peak EGT. As far as exhaust valve longevity, um, I, I, I uh, respectfully offer uh, the two engines on my Cessna 310, that, that uh, uh, one of which went to 220% uh, of TBO and the other one uh, which is still trucking, but I did do a top overhaul. So I guess you say both of the Sets of cylinders went to uh, um, went to 220 percent of TBO, operated consistently lean a peak, and I never once changed a cylinder because of a bad exhaust valve. I did change a couple of cylinders uh, due to um, uh, due to some cylinder head cracking. Um, these were very 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 old cylinders. Um, these were cylinders that dated back to the to, to to 1979 when the engine was originally built. Um, but I, I've never lost an exhaust valve in any uh, in, in, in any of the twelve cylinders on my airplane over uh, way you know way more than double TBO. So uh, the notion that uh, uh, that operating lean a peak is bad for exhaust valves is just plain wrong. It's just wrong. And oh by the way, um, you know if you drive home in a Toyota or a Lexus or anything, your engine is operating lean a peak. All of our car engines run lean a peak all the time because we couldn't, we couldn't pass uh, um, the, the emission standards if the engines weren't operating lean a peak. And I haven't, I don't, I don't know the last time anybody's had a change in exhaust valve in a car engine. Barry's wondering, uh, how, how do you recommend transitioning from takeoff settings, uh, 2850 RPM full throttle to climb settings, 2600 RPM, 2600 manifold pressure, and finally to cruise 2300 RPM, 2300 manifold pressure for a uh, rich peak operation in IO 520D? Um, uh Pretty simple. Um, I, I, my recommendation is to take off with with uh, both the throttle and the prop control um, far, firewalled, uh, climb to a safe altitude, uh, typically a thousand AGL, make an initial power reduction by reducing uh, the propeller and not touching the the, the prop, uh, climb up to cruise altitude and make another power reduction by reducing the propeller and not touching the prop. Um, I feel quite strongly, and I, I, I fly this way, uh, that, that normally aspirated engines um, should always be operated full throttle all the time, except when you're trying to land. <laughs> um, uh, 
Mother Nature is going to reduce your manifold pressure as, as you climb. She doesn't need your assistance in that regard. She does all the manifold pressure reduction necessary and unfortunately probably a little more. Um, so the, the way I fly these airplanes, and I've been doing this for, I don't know, more than five decades, uh, make your power reduction with the, with the propeller control and leave the, leave the throttle wide open. Barry's wondering, in your Cirrus story, how did the pilot reduce his RPM when he does not have an RPM control lever? Well, that's a good question. I, I won't get too far into the weeds, but basically the Cirrus has a peculiar setup. Um, uh, it's a single lever power control. And the uh, when you pull the power lever back from all the way forward, the first portion of, of pulling back the power lever uh, reduces RPM, but doesn't reduce manifold pressure. And um, when you pull the lever back far enough, typically when the prop, uh, but when RPM gets down to 2,500 or so and continue pulling it backwards, now it starts reducing both RPM and manifold pressure. Uh, and so now, now I'm talking, I'm, uh, this, is, uh, this is a normally aspirated Cirrus I'm talking about. Um, the turbocharged Cirrus is a little different. The, the SR22T doesn't even have control over the over RPM. They they have the prop governor welded to 2,500 RPM with a, a screwdriver adjustment that only mechanics can change. But I'm talking about a, a normally aspirated SR22, which was the, the one that we're, we're talking about here. And uh, as I said, you, when when you take off and you push the control all the way forward. Um, you, you get wide open throttle and 2,700 RPM. Uh, then when you start pulling the throttle back, um, the first thing that happens is RPM comes down, but manifold pressure stays the same. And then once you get down to about 2,500 RPM, assuming that the linkage is adjusted properly, uh, then reducing the power lever further uh, starts uh, closing the throttle as well as reducing RPM. So. Uh, that's uh, hopefully the answer to to the question. And if you pull a, the 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 power lever on a Cirrus SR22 back to 2,500 RPM, you will be at wide open throttle. Um, not not wide open power lever, but wide open throttle, and uh, and 2,500 RPM. And that's where most SR22 uh, pilots uh, cruise the airplane. Matthew is wondering, how do you know when you are too far over square? Um, well, uh, uh, I mean, the best way is what I think I've recommended in this in this presentation, which is to go get the manufacturer's manual and and observe his the manufacturer's over square limits. Um, I think they're probably very conservative. Uh, I, I know that you could go considerably further over square without doing damage if you're operating Lena Peak, but uh, you know I can't. I, 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 I'm I, I'm willing to do that for my own airplane because I can take responsibility for the consequences. I, I am not willing to uh, to to tell people to disregard um, the manufact the engine manufacturer's limitations on their own engines. You can do that if you want, but but. I'm not in a position to to tell you to do that. But the point that I was trying to make here was that even if you follow the engine manufacturer's limitations, the engine manufacturers, both Continental and Lycoming, authorize operation considerably um, over square. And, uh, and then if you understand, uh, and all of the engine manufacturer's publications, um, are, are predicated on rigid peak operation still. Um, and if you understand what's going on when you operate Lena Peak, then you could take some liberties with that, but I, I, I'm not going to recommend any specific numbers. Will is wondering, what are your thoughts on reduced RPM takeoffs? Um, I think it's a terrible idea. Um, it's, it's First of all, it's arguably not legal. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, I, I want the maximum performance I can possibly get out of my engines during takeoff until I'm up at a, at a nice safe altitude. 
Uh, so if something happens, I, I have the best possible chance of, uh, of, uh, of getting back down again uh, in one piece. So I certainly don't ever recommend uh, anything less than full power takeoffs. And Don's wondering, um, how much range did you extend your Belanca with, with your Lingam Peak uh, operation? Um, I, I actually wasn't uh, uh, keeping the kind of good um, notes on that back in those days that 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 uh, that I do now so I can't really give you um a uh a, a quantify a, 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 I can't really quantify that um it, it I I do know that it was a, it was a noticeable improvement um uh, but uh, but I can't I can't give you uh give you a percentage um uh with regard to the Belanca operation Barry is wondering if you can go back to the Lycoming 0360 engine chart showing the max over square limits. He would like to take a screenshot capture of that. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Uh, this is the Lycoming 0321. Uh, looks like, I think that's probably the one he was talking about. Okay. That's the that's Lycoming. A, that's the Lycoming. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, 0360, correct. 0360. Mm -hmm. Cool. But again, yeah. I would recommend to anybody who's interested in this to uh, obtain the, uh, obtain the uh, manufacturer's operator's manual for your particular engine. You can see this one. Uh, this one was, you know, this one is for an 0320, but uh, uh, I mean, a th an 0360, but. Um, uh, you can, you should be able to get a, a manual with this kind of chart for for pretty much any any engine that we're flying. And uh, Barry's just wondering if you could elaborate on your tricks for the O four seventy mentioned earlier for Lena Peak over square operation. Um. Uh, sure. The the very just very briefly. Um, uh, the two things that are helpful in improving uh, mixture distribution on an 0470, in my experience, um, one is to use a little bit of partial carburetor heat uh, to warm the air as it goes through the carburetor, which improves um, atomization of the fuel. And the second is to instead of operating at absolute wide open throttle, which is what I normally would recommend in the 0470 for cruise, I would recommend um, pulling back on the throttle until the very first slight indication of a reduction manifold pressure, like you know, a quarter of a needle's width is enough. The idea is to cock the, uh, the, the, the throttle butterfly in the carburetor throat just enough to cause turbulence as the air is going through the carburetor. And the turbulence um, also improves um, uh, fuel atomization. So a little turbulence and a little heat will uh, make a considerable difference in terms of the quality of the mixture distribution 0470. It's still not gonna be great. It's still not gonna be like an injected engine but it does improve it enough to allow you to operate at a leaner mixture than you otherwise would be able to operate uh, without the engine starting to run unacceptably rough. Evan is, uh, Kevin is wondering is if you have any speed performance examples between operating uh, under square and over square. Uh, speed? No, I, I, I don't. I really, uh, our engine monitors don't uh, typically instrument that, and I really don't have any, uh, I probably could maybe dig out some, some Cirrus data, because the Cirrus, uh, the Cirrus is instrument a whole lot of stuff, including ground speed, but I don't have anything at my fingertips that I could, uh, uh, that, that I can provide right now. Scott's wondering if you are unable to keep an eye on CHTs because of no engine monitor, it seems that operator over square would help ensure CHTs stay low, even though it is more challenging to operate lean of peak. Is this correct? 
Well, I think it is correct, but uh, but I also would be remiss if I didn't say you really ought to have an engine monitor. <laughs> it makes me very nervous, particularly in single engine airplanes, to see people fly around not knowing what their what their engine is doing. I've just seen too many um, uh, detonation, pre ignition events, and things like that that you would never be aware of until it's too late if you didn't have an engine monitor. Chris is wondering, does operating a turbocharged engine TSIO520 with an intercooler make any difference in operations? Um, well, sure, it, 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 it allows the engine to put out more power because it's breathing cooler, denser air. Uh, my my engines inc incidentally do not have intercoolers. Um, the principal difference between the engines in my airplane and the engines in the Cape Air 402Cs is that the 402C engines are are intercooled, and uh, and they are boosted a little bit higher, so they get more horsepower out of them, a little bit more. But uh, yeah, intercoolers are. Are, are helpful because they let you get uh, um, more power out of the engine without uh, uh, w without impairing detonation margin. Hmm. And Michael's wondering, uh, any difference with a turbo normalized engine, such as a Cessna TR-182 with the Lycoming 0540 L3? Um, well, all of what we've talked about, of course, is equally applicable to turbo normalized engines. Turbo normalized engines are tend to be a little more efficient than turbocharged engines because the turbo normalized engines typically um, uh, are uh, higher compression engines, so they um, are, are extract en uh, energy more efficiently and, and waste less. Uh, uh, the the um, the turbo normalized engines are typically eight and a half to one compression ratio engines. Most uh, turbocharged engines, turbo boosted engines are seven and a half to one, which means that they have a little bit less fuel efficiency and so on. So uh, I'm a big fan of turbo normalized engines. I think they're great. Donald's wondering if you can talk a little bit about the red box you referred to. Well, I probably need to pass on that uh, because it's hard to do that without putting some some pictures up on the screen and and I've got um, I, 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 I've got two webinars in the EAA series that are that are on the uh, EAA server uh, one called uh, leaning 101 and the other one called leaning the advanced class that 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 have all of the, the the nice slides that illustrate the the red box concept, and so I would refer you to uh, to those to those webinars. And uh, Rodrigo is just wondering um, where is a good place to get those charts that um, you were referring to for particular engines. Um, there are the operator's manuals that you can obtain from either Continental or Lycoming, depending on what your persuasion is. They, they typically are not available through, through the aircraft manufacturer. You have to go to the engine manufacturer. Gotcha. And uh, our artisan is just wondering, what about those of us who can't run Lena Peak? Uh, can you give the same advice about operating over square or not? Sure, absolutely. There's really no relationship there. Um, uh, operating over square uh, and, and operating Lena Peak are, are independent. Um, when, when I was uh, operating the Viking uh, going down to Mexico, I was I was operating over square, but I wasn't operating Lena Peak. We didn't have two nozzles back then. We didn't. We, we, we all still believe that operating Lena Peak was was bad for the engine. We've learned a lot over the you know the, the, the over the years uh, and but I didn't start really operating uh, Lena Peak until about 1990 and the, the the missions that I was flying in the Viking were were, were in the mid 70s. 
Steve's wondering what kind of pressures are typical in the engine cylinders? Um, round numbers um, with typical rich peak uh, settings, um, peak pressures of oh something like 800 psi in normally aspirated engines, sometimes as high as 1,000 psi in turbocharged engines. Operating lean of peak, they're considerably lower than that. And lo the, how much lower depends on how far lean of peak you're running. Hmm. And um, Jeff is just wondering, doesn't lean of peak operation mean using parameters favorable to promote detonation in the cylinder? Boy, that is such a, a, a myth. It's exactly the opposite than that. If you are, and, and I've spent, I spent some time down at uh, George Brawley's test cell down in A, Oklahoma, where we, we intentionally tortured engines and, and, and put them into detonation intentionally. Um, if, if, you, if you really want to put your engine into detonation, uh, the mixture setting that gives you minimum detonation margin and gives you the, the, the best chance of achieving detonation is about 40 degrees rich of peak. Um, it is almost impossible to get an engine to detonate uh, lean of peak uh, short of putting, some, putting jet A through it or some, some substandard fuel. But if the fuel that you're using meets specs, it's just about impossible uh, to get an engine to detonate lean at peak. Also, if you have um, um, a, an older designed engine that was designed originally, was certified originally for use with uh, with 8087 uh, Avgas, which we don't have anymore, but those engines were typically 7 to 7.0 7 to 1 compression ratio or around about that. Um, if you are operating one of those engines uh, on 100 octane fuel, which is all we can get nowadays uh, it is almost impossible to get those engines to detonate the the, the detonation margin is huge uh, on those older engines because they were designed for operation under on on lower octane fuel octane is a measure of the detonation resistance of the fuel and they were designed to operate on 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 uh, a, a a lower quality fuel if you will with with uh, uh, with less detonation resistance. So when we operate them on 100 low lead, you, it's almost impossible to get them to detonate. Richard is wondering, do you expect the new aviation fuel, if there are, if it's ever approved, to impact the overswear recommendation? No, no, I don't. The, 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 the new fuel, if it is ever approved, and uh, the FAA still claims that they're going to uh, the, the, they're going to have something by the end of next year. Um, it's probably going to be many, many years after that before it gets out into the, into the supply chain. But um, but but that fuel uh, will ha have will meet all of the same uh, detonation resistance characteristics and so on of of, of 100 low lead. Uh, that's what all this testing has been about to make sure that. That, that 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 fuel will uh, will perform just as well as as hundred low lead, and also to make sure that that mixtures of the old fuel and the new fuel will will work properly. That's another big problem that they've had is to make sure because for for many many years after that fuel is approved, we're going to be operating on on various mixtures of of leaded fuel and unleaded fuel because it's going to take a long time before the unleaded fuel gets out to, to all the airports and all of the leaded fuel goes away. Chase says, I have an 0470 made for 80 octane. Would you be scared to run off 89 non-ethanol car gas? No, we, we, we do real, real well with those engines, uh, with, with, uh, with MoGas. Uh, that's an excellent, an excellent engine to run on, on automotive fuel. And Wayne is just saying, wasn't um, wasn't Square really just dumbing down engine operation to avoid detonation? Well, um, prob probably was, and I don't know that it. You know, the old joke goes that if 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 you're in Europe and everything is measured in in uh, all your instruments are in metric units, it doesn't work too well. <laughs> but. Uh, 
uh, that, that's quite possible. Um, but but I know that uh, uh, somehow or other it got into the flight instructor conventional wisdom as as one of these absolute immutable laws of nature that if you didn't observe it, you know, all hell was going to break loose. And that just turned out not to be true. Griffith is wondering, is there any warning sign to, uh, to getting too close uh, to low RPM or too high over square? Any warning signs? Yeah. Um, uh, not really. Again, you know, the, the, the usual rules apply. Uh, you, you should have an engine monitor. You should be monitoring your cylinder head temperatures. If your cylinder head temperatures aren't excessive and if the engine is running smoothly, uh, you're good. If, if if the engine starts running rough or your cylinder head temperatures get uh, hotter than is comfortable, then you should do something about it. Hmm. All right. Well, we're getting close to the end here. Let's take the last question here before uh, we give you an opportunity for closing comments. Uh, Mark is wondering, do you have, uh, do any of your operating recommendations change if one is using electronic ignitions instead of a magneto? Um, with respect to... Uh... Well, let me think about that for a minute. And we've had a couple um, questions on that uh, about I electronic my, ignition. Yeah, my answer is uh, the recommendations do not change, but I think it's particularly important if you're running electronic ignition to, um, to have um, instrumentation that lets you watch your cylinder head temperatures. And the reason I say that is because um, um, many of the electronic ignition systems, and, and I'm thinking specifically of the electro air at the moment, which is the one that, that's available for certificated aircraft, um, they uh, advance the ignition timing. Um, they have variable ignition timing, and advance the ignition timing at, 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 um, at lower um, uh, manifold pressures. And um, advanced ignition timing has the uh, effect of, uh, of, of increasing um, uh, combustion chamber pressures and increasing cylinder head temperatures. And we've had a few problems with those systems um, uh, producing uh, excessive uh, CHTs. So particularly with um, electronic ignition, we've also had good success with them and we've also seen pretty significant improvements in fuel economy with them. So. Um, I'm not saying they're bad. Um, they're, they're, they're actually, if uh, if the electro air system were were certified for turbocharged airplanes, which it's not, uh, I would probably give serious consideration to putting it on my on, on my 310. But uh, what I am saying is that um, uh, the electronic ignition systems, um, because of their variable ignition timing, um, push the engine harder in in cruise, and um, and so it's particularly important to uh, to have decent engine instrumentation where you can monitor cylinder head temperatures and get some sort of alarm if if uh, the CHT gets too hot. Okay, Mike. Well, let's wrap it up there. We had wonderful attendance tonight. On my counter, I showed at one time 930 people logged in at that moment in time. So I know between the people that uh, came and left before or after that, we were well probably over a thousand tuned in uh, in its entirety tonight. What a great presentation you had tonight. Great turnout. So please take a moment and share your closing comments. Well, thanks, Tim, and I'm I'm very very pleased with the turnout tonight. That's that's just wonderful. Uh, just the usual stuff. Um, if you're not already on the list, uh, I invite you to sign up for my uh, my, my monthly e newsletter. Uh, you can do it at the website savvyaviation.com, or uh, if you stick around after the webinar, uh, Tim's going to put up a, a post webinar survey. I hope you do stick around and and fill out the survey. And on the survey, that there's a there's a checkbox that you can check if you'd like to uh, to get on the mailing list. Um, my my uh, two books are uh, available at Amazon. The engine book has been getting great reviews. It's a big, massive 508 page book on engines, and uh, uh, so anybody's interested in this stuff, uh, 
I think you'll get something out of that book if you're if 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 you're so inclined. And then just uh, to review uh, my, my next three um, upcoming webinars, um, uh, the December uh, webinar uh, is called Post Maintenance Checklist. Uh, it's more than a checklist, but we're going to be talking about um, what to do differently. Um, before flight, when you first pick up your airplane uh, out of maintenance, particularly out of major maintenance, sort of like an annual inspection or so on. Um, in January, uh, we're going to be re reviewing uh, uh, the subject of, uh, of annual inspections and what, what, what they are and what they aren't. And, and uh, uh, I think you'll find that an interesting presentation. And finally, February, um, uh, we'll be doing a a webinar on a subject that I get a lot of questions on, and that is uh, how properly to break in new cylinders, whether it's uh, uh, all new cylinders on a new engine or a top overhaul, or whether it's just one one cylinder after a cylinder change. So that's um, uh, that. That those are the the next three webinars that uh, are coming up through through February, and. Um, all I can say is thanks for coming. Mike, fantastic. And I'm reiterating what Evan said. Uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Mike, uh, from Dale. And Valen just says, thank you, Mike B. So wonderful presentation, Mike. Uh, just a lot of great feedback here from, from people. Uh, That's great good to hear. Yeah. So... Thank you so much, Mike Bush, uh, for volunteering your time to share this uh, awesome information with us. And to everyone who tuned in tonight, thank you so much for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening and hope you can tune in next week. Have a great night, everybody. Good night, everybody.